Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of gym, a campus gym, uh, and we're going to be trying to predict the number of attendees in a 10 minute period uh, in, during the gym. So for a given period of time, how many people are at the gym? That's given by this first column, and we'll be using all the other columns to make the uh, as features for the predictions. Alright, so let's hop into the notebook. I'm going to use NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. For pre-processing, we're going to use the train test split function and standard scalar. Um, the grid search is not for pre-processing, but for, uh, you know, actually, I'm not going to use grid search today, just for the, the uh, sake of time. Uh, oh man, getting this issue here. Let me reload the notebook. There's this uh, problem where you can't scroll down. All right, there we go. Okay, so uh, the uh, models we'll be using today is a ridge regression model, which is just linear regression with L2 regularization, uh, an MLP regressor, which is just a neural network, and a random forest regressor. So let's go ahead and import all of that, and we'll load in the data using pandas.readcsv. I can grab the CSV file path up here, copy that in, and we'll take a look. Alright, also look at data.info to see any more information we need. And it looks like we only have one object column. All the rest is numeric, so that makes our job easy. Uh, we also can point out that these are uh, either their numeric features, like temperature, or ordinal features, like day of the week. Uh, in any case, they're all perf uh, encoded as they should be. So the only object column is the date column. And that actually has uh, useful information inside it, uh, like year, month, day, hour, etc. Um, now what we could do is extract each of the features out of the date column and put them in their own columns. So I guess we'll do that and that will be the only only bit of real pre-processing to do here. Uh, so whoops. Let's create a function called preprocess inputs. That's going to take in a data frame, make a copy of it, and then return that data frame. I'll then get it, get back the output of this function and store it in X by passing in data. Now if we look at X, it's just a copy, but this is the copy that we can perform pre-processing on. So the first thing I want to do is work with this date column. So we're going to extract date features. So the way we can do this is if we look at the column, you can see it's an object column, which really just means it's a string column. But we can use the function pandas.toDateTime to turn it into, uh, sorry, pandas, pd, to turn it in, uh, oh, it's, it's processing, give it one sec. Uh, this will turn it into a daytime column. Um, and the nice thing about a daytime column is you can uh, pull out, you know what, this is taking too long, so what I'll do instead is pandas.toDateTime of just one of these. There we go. Okay, so we just grab one of these and put that in. Uh, it turns it into a daytime object, a timestamp object. The nice thing about that is we can type dot year to get the year, dot month to get the month, uh, say month hour, dot hour, you, you get the idea. So we can pull the uh, features out using this method. So I'm going to take the column, uh, which is date, and use pandas dot two daytime on it. Then we're going to t uh, get a year feature by looking at the date column, which is now in daytime format, and applying a function that maps every value to uh, the, the dot year attribute of that value. So this, this x is a given one of these, and then the year just pulls out the year. We'll do the same thing for month, day, hour, and minute. I'm not sure what this last thing is. Uh, that might be the time offset. We won't need to worry about that. Uh, I'll do, I'll do, uh, yeah, I don't think I'll, I'll not, I won't do seconds. Yeah, all right, so I'll just go by, by these 10 minute periods, because that's, that's what it's sort of broken down into. So, okay. Uh, this just has to become month. This has to become day. This will become hour, and this will become minute. And we can just go in and copy that into here, like so. Alright, so now we have a year column, a month column, a day column, an hour column, and a minute column. 
once we're done, we can just drop the year. Uh, I mean, sorry, the date column, because we took all the information we need out of it. All right, so that will just take a second to run, and we should be able to see what it looks like down here when it completes. And you can see we have these new columns now, uh, month, hour, year, day, and minute. Okay, so I'm trying to think if maybe we don't need the year. And the reason is I don't want to use year as an input to the model. It's not to say that there isn't useful information in it, but if you think about the purpose of us creating this model, we want something that can uh, take in some conditions at a gym and output uh, a prediction of how many people are in it. So if we needed to specify the year for that, um, it would this column wouldn't have much use if, if the model was being used on future data because all the years it would have been trained on would be past years. And so you can think of um, during training it sees a set of years and if we ever do uh, some future data we're always pushing uh, outside of the, the, the range of values that it was originally trained on. I mean obviously uh, yeah so like if, if you next year if, uh, if this was trained, I'm trying to see what which which year this was trained on. Actually, we can just check. We just take um, the year column and look at the features of it. So, 2015 to 2017. Okay, so if if we were to use this on future data, you can see that the model would have no experience with values in this column past 2017. So, there's not really any point of fault of having it. So, I'm going to drop it. Actually, you know, we don't have to drop like that. We just won't generate it in the first place. Okay. Now, we'll just split the data. So split DF into X and Y. Y is going to be what we're trying to predict. That's the number people column. And X is all the rest of the data. So I'll just drop uh, number people from axis 1. And we'll, we'll uh, do a train test split as well. So we'll put 70% of the data in the train set and the other 30% in the test set. So X train, X test, Y train, and Y test. And we'll use the train test split function from sklearn. We just pass in X and Y, specify our train size, let's make it 70%. Keep shuffle equals true, so that'll shuffle the data before it makes the split. And we'll give it a random state as well, so we can reproduce the split, uh, the shuffle, and therefore the split. And we'll return those four sets of data now over here. We'll get them back and let's look at X train. So X train should no longer have the number people column. Uh, it should that should only be in Y train. And as, uh, the the indices have been sh shuffled as well. And we're working with only 70% of the data. All right. So the last thing to do here is to scale the data. Um, so all the columns in the data set take on different ranges of values. Um, Oh, and if you're not sure what the timestamp column is, this is how many seconds have passed since the beginning of the day. So it's, it's sort of a, a measure of how far into, day, into the day we are. And we do have, maybe have some duplicate information here, but it's still nice to have uh, that extra column when we have such a small number of features. All right, so we want to give each column the same range of values. And for that, we're going to use a standard scalar. And a standard scalar uh, we'll just give each column a mean of 0 and a variance of 1 by shifting and scaling the data. So we'll fit the scalar just to the train set, and then we'll transform the scalar, uh, transform, sorry, both the train and test set using the, the scalar we fit only to the train set. All right, and this actually returns a NumPy array, so let's go back in and turn it into a data frame, keeping the index uh, the same as it was and the column names the same as they were. And then we'll just go ahead and copy this over for X test. And now if we run this, our pre-processing should be complete. We should have scaled data. And we'll move on to training. And for training, um, we'll create this dictionary of models. Uh, let's just look at this. You can see that the columns have now been scaled so that every column has a mean of zero and a variance of one. So this dictionary over here, I want to give the name of the model, which will be linear regression or ridge regressor. 
I'll just pass a ridge in. So that's it, it maps the name of the model to the instance of the model. And then we will uh, have a neural network. And that was our MLP regressor. And then we'll have a random forest model, which was our random forest regressor. And now, uh, well, let me just indent these. And then for name and model in models.items. So the items uh, function returns the key value pairs as tuples, so you can iterate through two at a time like that. And we'll just fit each model on the train set, and then print out the name of the model followed by a little message that says it was trained. And you can see as each one trains, it will display a message. So let's get the results. Uh, and so here I'm going to calculate the RMSE and R squared score. So the RMSE is a way to just basically look at how, uh, what's your average error across all training examples. So we can use model.predict to get a set of predictions. Um, and I, what I'm going to do is just use the best model we trained. So I'll actually pause the video. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll just show each one. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll compare all of the RMSEs. So for name and model in models.items, like we did before, we're going to get a set of predictions, which I'll call ypred. And that's predicting on the test set. Uh, and then what we do is we calculate the error between each training example. So we'll take the real values for the test set, which is y test, subtract y pred, um, and that will be, you know what, let's make this a separate function, get RMSE. This takes in a test set and a set of predictions. And to get the RMSE, we, we, we get the element-wise errors between the training examples. Um, and we want to take the average error, right? So this is root mean squared error, so we want the mean. Um, however, we square it first so that when we take the mean, we don't have the positives and negatives canceling each other out. So we square them element-wise, then we take the mean, and then we take the square root to bring the unit back into the original unit of the target variable. All right, so it's finished. Uh, let me just show you what this looks like. Uh, we do model.predict on x test, and we'll store that in ypred. You can see uh, these are the element wise errors. Uh, sorry, these are just the predictions. If we do y test minus ypred, we get the element wise errors. I'm not sure why it's showing it as an array, it usually shows it as a panda series. Oh, is y test an array? Interesting. All right, anyway, uh, these are the element-wise errors. Wait, uh, give me one second. I have to figure out. These should not be the same, so give me one second. All right, so actually what I'm going to do is um, just write the function and then plug it in. So uh, this is the RMSE. It's the error, square, so the squared error, the mean squared error, and then the root mean squared error. And we'll just return it over here. Uh, and down here, we'll call get RMSE, passing in ypred, and we'll print it out. So that will be the RMSE, and we'll print it out. Uh, so we'll put the name of the model, followed by RMSE, and we'll display it to two decimal places. Pass in RMSE there. Uh, oh, there we go. Alright, and we can see the RMSE. So, that's very interesting. The random forest is giving us zero error. That's, I thought there was something wrong. I, this seems very unlikely. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to train another one. So model equals random forest regressor. And model.fit x train y train. For it to have zero error, that means that the targets would have to exactly match up with the <clears throat> with the um, the values in here. Maybe there's a problem with y test. 
Oh, is there a problem with Y test? This doesn't make any sense. Why is Y test a NumPy array? <laughs> oh man, I'm running into an issue. Okay, let's try rerunning this. I feel like there's probably some problem with Y test. Maybe somehow Y test was set to the predictions made by Random Forest, and that's why we're getting zero error. Let's try this one more time. So I'll have to train it. Um, and in the meantime, I'll continue with this. We just won't get to see the, the results. All right, so we have the RMSCs. Now I'm going to get the R squared score. So get, get R2 is the name of this function. And this is also going to take in a, a test set and a set of predictions. And we'll calculate the R squared score by first taking the sum of squared errors for our model. So that's Y test minus Y pred, uh, squaring that and then summing it. And then comparing this to the baseline model. So the baseline model is the model you use when you only have the, tr the labels, the targets available to you. You have no input data. In that case, the best thing you could do is just guess the mean of the, co of the y, y test uh, every time. Or I guess Y train, right? In this case, it's Y test. So we get the sum of squares for the baseline model, which is numpy.sum of Y test minus Y test dot mean, and then square that. And we compare these two. Whoops. Uh, so we put uh, hours on the numerator and the baseline on the denominator and then show it as a fraction. So in this case, if we have zero error, the whole fraction will go to zero. Uh, if we have infinite error, this whole fraction will go to positive infinity. And it makes more sense to do one minus this, which is the definition of the R squared score. Uh, the reason for the one minus <coughs> is just for interpretability. Now when we have zero error, uh, this fraction goes to zero and one minus zero is one. So we have the best possible score of one. And on the other hand, if we have infinite error, this fraction goes to infinity and one minus positive infinity is negative infinity. So on the other hand, we have uh, the worst R squared score we can get is negative infinity. I mean, it can't actually get there, but it approaches it. Um, all right, so we'll calculate the R squared score and return it. Put these together. And now we'll just copy this over and do the same thing for R squared. So get R2, and this is R2 and we'll print it out. We'll display it to five decimal places passing in R2. All right, let's rerun this one. Okay. All right, so this is much more reasonable. Now we fix the problem. We now have a 6.62 um, RMSE in random forest, which means by, by uh, on average, we're off by about 6.6 .6 people, which is actually fairly good. Uh, the other ones are trailing behind. Uh, it looks like here the ensemble net, um, ensemble model is outperforming the other two individual models by a lot. And that's reflected by the R squared score as well. Uh, we have a 0 .1, 0 0.91 R squared for the random forest, which means there's a 91% reduction in error between the baseline model and our model. All right, and that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.